We got a newbie in the group. Who are you guys? Yeah, hi, I'm from the Daily Evergreen. Okay, just check it. Nice cut, man. Thank you. Good. Ready? What's up, man? Just start with questions. Coach, I remember after the Stanford game, you said you were kind of scratching your head about the result given how well the team played on, on Thursday. Just looking back at the film, I mean, does anything else stand out now in hindsight? Yeah, the biggest thing that stands out is that I, I think we went a nine-minute stretch to start the game without a foul, without a whistle, which is just the most amazing thing I've ever seen in a game. And you go back and look at the tape, you see how fatigued both teams were, and yet there were people at the scores table ready to come in. One of us, Stanford us, needed to burn a timeout. Uh, it's very difficult for a guy like Jeff Pollard to play that longer stretch of a game. Robo, any of those guys are out there for that matter. We typically have subs in the game, and so that's on us and noticing that. And I'm sure Stanford noticed the same thing. You almost had a, a test of wills where we took control of the game early out the gate. And then during that stretch, they came back on us. <coughs> I think fresh troops on the, on the floor made a big difference for us. That's the first thing uh, that I noticed. Uh, the next thing that I noticed again was we had another one of those games where you come down to the last three minutes of a game, the game is right there. And we've had six of those, I think, this year in terms of closing them out. And then all of a sudden they close out, they step up another level, they hit a couple of tough shots here or there, and we didn't, and it was a difference in the game. The third thing I noticed with us is that when we have everybody on their game at the same time, uh, like we did on, on, on a Thursday night, we're a pretty good basketball team. Our margin of error to have one or two players not quite there, uh, we tend to struggle a little bit offensively and defensively, uh, I notice as well too. So it's just important that uh, at game time, game day, game time, everybody's ready to play, everybody's on their game, everybody gives you uh, the production and things that you're looking to get out of people and everything else. Sometimes that's hard to do, but at the same time, uh, veteran teams do it and, and we need to get there. And this team remains pretty tight-knit, it seems like, even after frustrating results. That might not have been the case in past seasons. Just what's different for you this year? Um, what's different with this group is my assistant coaches, I think, have done an outstanding job of recruiting and who they brought in the door that are great fits for uh, this community, the college campus, great fits for our team and, and the way we coach and all of those things. I think the mentoring that goes on uh, within our program is, is excellent because you're growing a basketball team, basketball program, but you're growing young people as well too. And along with that is uh, on losses, I need to send them into the stands to thank people for being there so they can understand how you deal with adversity uh, on a winning game against uh, a Cal, on a losing game that you let get away like Stanford. That's just all part of this process. So when we look at what we brought in the door, uh, the staff that's in hand right now, I think we do an excellent job of keeping these guys all together and moving in the right direction. It's, <clears throat> it sounds like a road trip here uh, to the Oregon schools. Uh, have you put anything as keys for these two games? Uh, how do you really match up with these guys? Real quick, Colton, is that you? Yes, it is me. Okay. Uh, okay. Do we have anyone else on the phone? Okay. Colton, can we finish any questions from in here, and then we'll take some questions from the phone? Oh, yeah, of course. Great, thank you. Um, it, as weird as it sounds, does it almost make the game tougher when to not have Opala play just because you probably had prepped for him to be in and then all of a sudden he's not playing and they change their entire scheme and maybe yeah, kind of messes with what you guys were preparing for? You know, sometimes it will do that. We expected the the the, uh, the guard to be out, the really good shooter that's out on that squad. We knew he was not going to play. When Apollo didn't show up to play, yes and no. Uh, yes in a sense that... Um, other players on that team may step up and even rise to the occasion and play better because of having to fill those those shoes and everything, filling that role, getting those minutes and those shots. And then also, uh, I, I think you're 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 ready to go with this really great player and how to have a game plan. And all of a sudden, he's not there and not playing. It switches things a little bit. Uh, does that have anything to do uh, with with energy, uh, uh, effort blocking out, effort rebounding, rotations, all those things over a 40-minute game? No, because those things should look the same regardless of who's on the floor. So if, if you move the ball uh, the way we should have moved the ball, if we rotate and block out like we normally do and do those things, uh, the game takes care of itself anyhow regardless of that. We, we let a great, I mean a great opportunity uh, get away from us just because of the energy in the building and the fact that they had their, their best player not playing. Um, go ahead, sir. Oh, okay. All right. Looking back at the Stanford game, um, at least through most of the first half, I noticed there was a lot of up and down. You guys are going to run, then a drought, then another run, and another drought. So 
<clears throat> moving forward, are you, uh, like, what ways are you looking to be more consistent scoring the ball? I think the biggest thing uh, with, with our team to make sure we're consistent throughout the course of the game is good shots. That's the thing that typically what we have charted with our guys is that when we turn the ball over and when we take bad shots, normally, and we don't block out those three areas, teams are scoring on us, and they're scoring on us at a pretty high clip. Uh, about 50% of their points were coming from our bad shots, giving up a, a bad play, a defensive transition. Our turnovers, giving up a bad defensive transition. And when you forget to block out, give up an easy bucket. So the answer is all within our control. Take good shots, don't turn the ball over, and block your guy out. Uh, it's not that difficult to do, but yet I'm, I'm making it sound like it's not, but in the, in the heat of the battle it is because when you have so many new guys and guys feeling like uh, they want to win the game, they want to get it done, they tend to do that. And then one guy will knock out a rotation, and sure enough, guys will follow suit that everybody starts to hunt, as I call it, versus playing together and giving the ball up. Uh, this team knows this because they certainly have seen uh, enough footage on it. It's just a matter of having to – the discipline to understand it and do it uh, game in and game out, whether you're at home, whether you're on the road. You, you, you better play the right way on the road, really play smart, and, and not turn the ball over and not take bad shots because the road can be tough on you if you do that. I'm sure you uh, – the results against Oregon State last year probably weren't what, anywhere near what you wanted, and I'm sure you remember playing against Ralph Miller's teams and Gil Coliseum in the 70s. I mean, what makes Oregon State a tough matchup, especially when you're playing them on the road? In this conference, every team is a tough matchup on the road. It, it just is. You're in, a, you're in a day and age where it's it's just it's tough uh, to win on the road. That's why any opportunity you get, you want to take advantage of it. And if we put ourselves in position to close the game, we need to do that. The reason it's so tough, uh, number one, everybody has those great home court advantages where they play more comfortable at home. Oregon State is one of the older arenas that when that crowd gets in there and, and the roar is there, uh, you feel it. It's a great in college basketball environment when the fans are there and the noise is there. you got to really handle yourself in that environment. It seemed that uh, against Stanford, one of the things that the team struggled with was breaking that kind of triangle into 3-2 that Stanford was coming out of uh, when you guys were in the half-court offense and they'd send uh, Sharma and De Silva and they'd kind of trap the ball in the corner or um, kind of near half-court. Is that something that's kind of been a focus on practice to be able to try and uh, – Address that and break that? Well, actually, it was a 1-3-1 one, one zone where they trap you in those trapping areas. The mm -hmm. same 1-3-1 one, one zone that we drove people crazy with last year <laughs> with the Renze Cheatham up front. The same 1-3-1 one, one zone uh, that won some games for us coming back from 25 down last year. The same 1-3-1 one, one zone we played all the first part of this year. We even just played it at Utah to cut the lead and get us back in the game. So the difference in it was uh, we tend to send you with 6-6, six, 6-5, six, uh, six, and 6-8 six, up there, and it really looks long. They're up there with 6-9, six, 6-9, nine, six, nine, and 7 feet, right. and it looks even bigger, which made it difficult to see through, see over the top of, and the, and the adjustment that we needed to make uh, was get the shooters in the corner and try to penetrate it with, with ball handling. Unfortunately, in that game, uh, Ahmed was the only shooter that was really on his game, so we stuck him in the corner, and then all of a sudden you got bigger players trying to dribble through and maybe don't handle the ball as well. But it was nothing surprising to us that we have not seen before. We run the exact same defense. It's just in the course of the game, which you guys were kind of off their game a little bit, when it hit them, it just took them off their game a little bit more, and particularly the way they would show it, get away from it, show it, get away from it that way. Speaking of shooters in the corner, it's been a tough stretch for Carter, both offensively and defensively. Um, what are you looking for from him to kind of get back into a rhythm? Carter, in my opinion, uh, all he has to do is stay positive. And I told him if, if anybody uh, should enjoy Washington State, it, sh it should be Carter. Here was a young man uh, that was not recruited, and we were lucky to get him. And when he came in on his visit, the way he shot the ball, and I, I was shocked that nobody recruited him. And then he had an incredible year that I think shocked him. Uh, his dad, who was a coach, has already mentioned that it shocked him that he played so well last year because he did. He was perfect for our system, style of play, and all those things. The unfortunate thing with that is everybody knows who you are now, and people are sitting on him. And what he doesn't do is have the athleticism to go blow by somebody and dunk on that. He, he is a terrific basketball player in the open court where we can find him, and that's why it's so important to take good shots. Because when you take good shots, he's going to get his shots. If you are forcing things and knock yourself out of rhythm, 
he's not going to get a lot of looks. He'll more Vionte Daniels that matter because teams tend to sit on him as well, too. Those guys came into the year as having three of the top five three-point shooters in the conference coming back with Vionte Carter and Robo. Well, Robo at 6'7", it's hard to sit on him because he can still get a shot off on you. But the other two guys, you can put longer-arm athletes on him and sit on him. So they tend to struggle a little bit. So the only thing wrong with Carter is, is what's wrong with this team when they don't take good shots. It'll knock them out of rhythm, and a guy like Carter, Vionte, won't get their looks. So it starts with defense and getting stops because you can get up down the floor and give them looks in transition. When you're in the half court, I'm going to sit on him and take those shots away because he is a terrific shooter. Mm -hmm. So stay positive, be patient. Uh, there's still a lot of basketball left, and there's still a lot of shooting I need for him to do. Um, you talked last week about Chance Moore's progress and what you saw from him early. Uh, another couple guys you have coming in, Ryan Murphy and Darren Henson. Talk about them a little bit, kind of what you've seen maybe from tape and in person. Ryan is a, a, a pure, pure shooter. Everybody thinks Carter shoots it well. Ryan shoots it better than that, if you can imagine that, in terms of when he can get on a roll and make buckets. A, a competitor, a very, very, very smart and heady basketball player, having played with a lot of great players, uh, his dad is coaching those types of things as well, too. Darren is is more of a robo style where he's got that kind of a body on him. He's put on a little bit more weight, but at six seven, another what I would call a terrific shooter. Uh, maybe not as coming in the uh, door, he won't be where Robo is right now, the consistency of it, but he has the potential uh, to really be a really good player at this level. Both of them are going to really help us a lot. This is going to be trip number four back to Eugene as a head coach now. I mean, is, are the emotions bittersweet whenever you go back to Oregon now just because not only did you coach at your alma mater, but you had a successful playing career there as well? You know, today being my birthday, so I'm a little bit older because at one point in time I used to say half of my adult career was spent in Eugene, Oregon, from your playing days, coaching days, to living there. And, and that's huge. Your kids were raised there. So I think anytime you go back into an environment with that type of connection and knowing so many people uh, personally, uh, it's going to be a little bit different feel than going on any other road trip. But at the same time, you know, I, I've been out of Eugene enough. My kids now live in Portland and I'm back and forth in the state during the off season enough that it's not that big of a deal. The, the bigger deal with it is having a team that's ready to compete and play. Jordan's got a newborn. He, I talked to him last week. You said you're really enjoying being a grandpa now. When you make the trip back to Oregon, does that kind of help you put your coaching career and your playing career and how long it's been in perspective a little bit? Sitting here talking to you puts that in perspective, quite frankly, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Asking me that question about my grandkids puts it in perspective because usually your media aren't talking to you about your grandkids because you've been at it for so long. But, but it does, but I think the thing that I'm, I'm going to tell all of you is that the day uh, I come in here at a press conference and you feel like that guy's just worn out, tired, can't speak, you don't feel my passion and energy, then it's time for me to move on. But uh, this game is a, is a great game. And uh, the best part about this game is the young men that you get to develop, guys that are coming from nowhere, nobody recruited, and all of a sudden they're, they're on a prospect of a pro list, guys that have had terrific careers shit that nobody knew about, guys that even come in in the door, your own social media beat them up as to who's that guy, and now here they are studs, that's what coaching is about. Uh, developing players, uh, moving the needle with programs, winning games, all of that is important. But when it's all said and done, uh, when you have that birthday and you get the number of phone calls that I've got, not from just around the country, but around the world from young people that you've pretty much brought from the same scenarios that guys you're bringing through things in this program in terms of their personal lives too, that's what this business is all about for all of us coaches, developing young people, winning games, but the experiences of giving those young people an opportunity to really grow in their lives. And just last one for me now. You coached Jordan while you were at Oregon, too. Your daughter's name is Mackenzie. Marcus is there as well. Just how many memories do you have from that experience, being able to share your coaching career in Eugene with all of them? You know, I think uh, when you look at coaching, I've had a chance to spend, you know, seven years in Saudi Arabia. I was six years at St. Mary's as the head coach, and we, we turned that program around. You're at a Colorado State and turned the program. You're at Stanford when we turned the program as well, too. So the memories are, are plentiful because there's just so much and, and so many people's lives that you have dealt with. So uh, Oregon is just another stop that when you get off the coaching pedestal and you turn around and look back, and then you start to realize everything that is going on in terms of where you've been and the lives you've affected in that, that's when you think about it. Right now, 
I'm a cougar, and my job is to build this program. So our focus is not on looking back. It's on looking ahead. What do we need to do next? Tweak it, turn it, move it, motivate, move the needle with these guys to get them to win another basketball game, to get them through hopefully having a successful season this year with a lot of basketball to go. So my meetings with my staff right now are really talking more about who we are and what we need to do next to get so-and-so ready to go, to get this guy more on his game, to tweak a system this way. we are It's constantly the game. The game never, ever, ever leaves my brain. Never. And and moving into this program never leaves my brain. It's, it's every day. I don't care if it's my birthday. I'm doing a radio show tonight. You don't celebrate birthdays. You celebrate getting ready again and having some success. Um, right, question. Let's go to the phones, and uh, if okay. there's still questions you have, we can come back. But Cole, what's that question? question? Cole, Colton? All right, well, Colton. We covered the bases there. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, so, like you said, moving the program forward and then uh, talking about the road trip and everything, uh, the team struggled a lot this year on the road, has yet to get a win away from Pullman. Um, is there anything specifically for this road trip that you're looking for, like to prepare differently, maybe have them dress differently, wear a different shirt or something on a certain day? No, no, no. First of all, if, if you look at our, our road games, uh, this will be the second road game uh, and the first one being uh, the Montana State game uh, over in the Tri Cities, and even that game, uh, you were still kind of banged up because Isaiah Wade had had just gotten back, but not gotten back on this game. So you're really, literally, uh, if I'm saying this correctly, the first road game where we've had our whole team, and our whole team being healthy. And the key to this week is just getting them on their game, so that when we get into those two environments over there, the energy in those two buildings are going to be at another level than these new guys have ever seen before. And hopefully their their <coughs> games and their confidence is ready to raise up to that level. Because if they do, uh, then it, it's going to be two great games with us putting ourselves in an opportunity to win games as well, too. And that's the biggest thing that you look at in terms of going on the road this time. You, you don't look back again and worry about what's here. We know what happened. And even in some of those road games, you're right there to win the game. I'm anxious to get on the road and to see how – our team's going to respond with everybody being together and everybody being healthy now. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Coach. Yep.